settled around 400 AD, Venice is one of the most unique and incredible cities in the world. Throughout its long history, Venice was almost entirely dependent on the sea for trade and survival. Everything it needed came by ship, and all those residing there, whether rich or poor, lived their lives according to the water surrounding them. As a great maritime republic, Venice had always produced seafaring vessels, but they were mostly built in private shipyards before any organized manufacturing center came into existence. By the end of the 12th century, rivalries with other trading powers, as well as the ever-increasing need for warships, drove the Venetians to develop the arsenal. Many historians refer the Venetian arsenal as the first factory in the world for the way it revolutionized manufacturing and production. For the first century of its existence, the facility was mostly used for ship repair and storage of the city's fleet. However, by the early 1300s, the arsenal was expanded to become Venice's state-managed center of shipbuilding and the provision of military resources. Maritime activities that were historically carried out in small workshops scattered around a port were now consolidated in a central location. It provided for all stages of shipbuilding and repair, as well as the manufacture of sails, ropes, oars, and other essential parts of the ship. It held forges to create nails, iron fittings, and weapons, furnaces for casting anchors, and later on, cannons. Also, to further increase the efficiency, the warehouses to store all of the raw materials were built on site, close to the production areas. The centralization of these functions at the arsenal was revolutionary at the time. The best Europe had to offer elsewhere was the medieval guild system. It was a slow and tradition-bound way craftsmen had of passing on skills to their sons or apprentices, while monopolizing production and sale of craft pieces in a given region. At the arsenal, standardized parts could be mass-produced in advance, allowing for the boats to be turned out much faster, on an industrialized scale. The production process was split into several stages, each with its own specialized workforce for the given area. Up to 100 galleys could be under production in its workshops at any one time, but instead of the workers moving around to service each new ship as in other shipyards, the ships were physically moved through each expert stage. This was the world's first assembly line. These kinds of innovations are something the world wouldn't see again until the Industrial Revolution centuries later, and in some cases until Henry Ford employed them in the production of cars in the early 20th century. Venice's most important ships, the galleys, were now required and also the only ships to be produced at the arsenal. Extreme attention to detail and constant sea trials gave Venetian ships their edge against other maritime powers of the time. This included controlling and integrating all stages of production, extended right down to the raw materials. For example, the wood supply was tightly controlled and regulated. The arsenal supervisors and carpenters traveled to the forest themselves to select individual trees for important and essential parts of the ship. The growing threat of the encroaching Ottoman Empire in the last half of the 15th century forced Venice into further transformation of the arsenal. The arsenal was expanded to become the nerve center of a vast war machine that consumed 10% of Venice's public budget. It grew into a massive munitions and weapons depot, storing and producing all weapons of war, all types of ammunition, and various types of armor. Improvements were made to the designs of firearms and artillery as the facility became an area of scientific and engineering innovation. Great scientists of the day, such as Leonardo da Vinci and later Galileo, spent time at the arsenal experimenting with new designs and improving the efficiency of the weapons and ships. The workers enjoyed exceptional privileges, such as guaranteed employment, Europe's first pension system, and even a continuous supply of wine. By the year 1500, the arsenal was the most powerful and efficient ships and munitions manufacturer in the world, employing up to 16,000 people at its height. It was capable of producing one fully equipped merchant or military vessel per day, while production of similar sized ships elsewhere in Europe could take months. The arsenal allowed the small city-state of Venice to grow into a world power and at one time the richest place on earth. The wealth brought into the city built some of the greatest buildings of its age, and its powerful families commissioned the world's greatest painters. The Republic of Venice became the greatest commercial power in Europe, and dominated trade in the Mediterranean Sea and beyond. Its land area was a tiny fraction of the Ottoman Empire, but with its powerful fleet, 
Venice was able to control the important islands of Crete and Cyprus in Ottoman coastal waters. The Venetian navy kept the Ottomans' ambitions in check for over three centuries. After the start of the Ottoman-Venetian War in 1570, the arsenal saw its most important test of its abilities. By this time period, rather than having a reserve war fleet already sitting at dock, a prefabricated production system was in place at the arsenal. A ready supply of unfitted ship hulls and their respective parts were separately stored and tagged with a specific number. When war broke out, all the assigned pieces of the specific ship were quickly assembled together and it was completed within the day. The Venetian arsenal managed to get a fleet of 100 galleys to the sea in just 50 days. Venetian warships played their most important role in the war at the decisive Battle of Lepanto in October 1571, one of the largest naval battles in history. The Venetians were part of an alliance of Catholic states called the Holy League, formed to confront the threat posed by the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean Sea. The leaders of the alliance were Habsburg Spain, the Republic of Venice, Pope Pius V, and John of Austria. John was the half-brother of King Philip II of Spain, and was designated as the supreme commander of the Holy League fleet. The Venetians contributed 115 of the 212 total Holy League ships, with Spain and the Republic of Genoa also making significant contributions. In the years before the war, Venice's shipbuilders created a new type of warship, the Gallius. They were developed from common merchant galleys and converted into heavily armed warships with a forward wooden gun turret and cannons along its sides. The Gallius was heavier and had an additional deck stretching the length of the vessel for movable cannons. This allowed shooting in any direction compared to a traditional galley, which was limited to attacking forward in the direction they were sailing. The advantage in firepower carried on board made the Gallius about five times as devastating an attack as a regular galley. Relatively few of them were ever produced, but six of them were made in time to take part in the Battle of Lepanto. The Ottoman fleet outnumbered the Holy League having around 280 ships, but they were massively outgunned by the Christian forces. Due to the impressive firepower brought by the Venetian ships, the Catholic forces had over 1,800 total cannons, while the Ottomans possessed only around 750. Also, the Christian forces had another tactical advantage, with thousands of soldiers equipped with arquebuses, while the Ottomans still mainly employed composite bowmen on their ships. The battle began on basically three separate fronts, right off the western Greek shore on October 7, 1571. In the center, the innovative Galliuses made an immediate impact on the battle with their overwhelming firepower, shocking the Ottoman admiral leading the fleet. Their cannons tore into the Ottoman front line, decimating the ships and setting the stage for the entire battle. Also, the heavily armored Galliuses completely disrupted the enemy lines of attack as the Ottoman fleet then had no choice but to bypass these slow but extremely powerful ships. Their presence behind the lines even prevented organized retreat or regrouping by the Ottoman forces. Massive ship-to-ship -ship fighting in the center eventually led to the Ottoman Admiral Ali Pasha being killed. In the north, the two forces battled each other against the Greek shore. The Ottoman commander attempted to outflank the Venetian-like galleys, but the Venetians turned to face the threat and held the line. Brutal ship-to-ship -ship fighting ensued next, and the arrival of a single Gallius in the area turned the tide of the battle against the Ottomans on the northern front. With the outcome of the overall battle looking grim for the Ottomans, their commander in the south was temporarily able to outflank the Holy League line and inflict some damage on a number of enemy ships. However, his fortunes were short-lived as he was forced to flee when reserve units of the Holy League arrived on scene. Isolated fighting on all fronts continued for a few more hours, but the battle was essentially over. The Battle of Lepanto was an overwhelming victory for the Holy League, and it heralded the end of Ottoman expansion into the Mediterranean Sea. The Holy League captured or destroyed about 210 Ottoman ships, while losing less than 20 of their own. The Ottomans lost 30,000 irreplaceable sailors and skilled bowmen, compared to 7,500 men for the Holy League. The Catholic gunmen proved decisive, causing tremendous casualties to the Ottoman troops. Over 10,000 Christian galley slaves were freed from the Ottoman ships during and after the battle. The six Venetian galleasses wreaked havoc throughout the entire battle, destroying up to 70 Ottoman ships by some accounts. 
The Holy League owes his victory at Lepanto in large part to the forges of war at the Venetian arsenal. Disunity in the months and years ahead prevented the Catholic forces to capitalize on their victory at Lepanto and the Holy League disbanded in 1573. After Lepanto, the Ottomans struggled to compete with the naval innovations of the European powers and concentrated more on land campaigns. The arsenal continued to be the main source of wealth and power for Venice for hundreds of years. However, with the fall of Venice to Napoleon in 1797, the Republic ended, as did the production in the arsenal. Today, the Venetian arsenal is used as a training location for the Italian Navy, and it stands as a lasting symbol of the former power of the Republic.